بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحابه أجمعين أما بعد uh, Last week we concluded the station of السماع listening and today we enter a new station and that's the station of الحزن sorrow However, Ibn Qayyim رحمة الله عليه uh, comments on the station and he says that it's not really a station and the idea here um, just kind of refresh our minds when we say a station what's meant by a station is that it, this is a place this is a type of feeling, a type of engagement with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning through this particular action or act or uh, emotion, we engage Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So for example, the last one, as sama listening, we listen and it becomes a stage of spirituality because we use our sense of listening in order to listen to the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and reflect on how that impacts us. So a station is something that we can utilize to, to walk the path, the seeker's path. And that is the path of a sirat al-mustaqim, a straight path that's taking us to Allah and to uh, paradise. So Ibn Qayyim Rahmatullah says that al-huzun, sorrow, is not really a station. Uh, nor is, are we commanded to be sorry or to feel sorrow. Contrary to the other stations where you'll find a verse or a uh, hadith that's telling us to do this. So, Ya ladina amanu, Ya yulida amanu, wa la takunu kalladina qalu sami'na wa hum la yasma'un. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Do not be like the people who say, We hear, but in reality they're not listening. Right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as the verses we mentioned last time, He tells us to listen. Listen to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying. Understand what He's saying. Listen, meaning. We hear and we obey. Right? Um, another example, i'tisam, grabbing hold to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Do this with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do this with the religion of Allah. However, when it comes to sorrow, huzun, there's not a single verse or hadith as far as I know of, or as far as Ibn Qayyim knows of, that's telling us to be sad. Quite the contrary. Anytime sorrow, huzun is mentioned in the Quran or hadith, right? it's Telling us not to do it or to stay away from it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, wala tahinu wala tahzanu. You know, don't weaken nor and don't be sorry. Don't be don't have don't let sorrow overtake you. And he, this verse is in the context of um, warfare and dealing with the opposition, the enemy. You know, don't weaken, don't be discouraged, don't let their strength, for example, or a particular victory of theirs cause you to weaken uh, your morale or Cause you to become sorry or full of sorrow. Another verse, وَلَا تَحْزَنْ عَلَيْهِمْ The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala tells the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam many times in the Qur'an, وَلَا تَحْزَنْ عَلَيْهِمْ Don't be sorry for them. Right? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in his, uh, in, his, uh, in his enthusiasm, in his motivation to bring people to Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala, to get them to Islam, and he's looking at the reaction of people, right? and how they're reacting with him, and how they're rejecting him, and how... You know, he's, he's doing his best. He's doing everything in his, his, his arsenal. Right? Everything that he's equipped with, he's presenting it and using it. Uh, he's talking to them in different ways, day, night, in uh, public gatherings, in pi- private gatherings, you know, with the verses of the Qur'an, with logic, with reason, all of it. He's trying to use it in order to get them to Islam. But what is their, the common reaction? Eh. We don't need this. Stop doing it. Or they ridicule him or mock him or sometimes even uh, assault him. This brought about a lot of huzun, sorrow to the Prophet ﷺ. But what is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling him? Don't be sorry. Right, let that go. Don't let that sorrow uh, capture your heart. And why? We'll get to in a moment. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا تحزن إن الله معنا. Uh, in the, when the Prophet ﷺ and Abu Bakr radiallahu an were escaping Mecca in their hijrah and their immigration, we know that they went to the cave and they were hiding there for three days. And during this time, the people of Mecca, the pagans of Mecca, were looking for them. And they got so close to finding them that there was a pagan right outside the cave to where Abu Bakr and the Prophet ﷺ could see his, his feet. And Abu Bakr radiallahu an said, Ya Rasulullah, you know, if he just looks down, he'll find us. And it's all over. It's done. Right? There's no escape. They're cornered. They don't have any weapons. There's nothing they can do. There's no escape. So the Prophet ﷺ responded to Abu Bakr and said, Abu Bakr, what do you think of two people? The third is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in honor of this moment, capturing this moment, 
Allah subhanahu wa documents it in the Quran in Surah at Tawbah, in which the Prophet told Abu Bakr, La tahzan inna Allah ma'ana. Don't be sorry, don't be afraid, right? Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with us. Uh, and in an, another verse, فَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ Allah subhanahu wa tells the believers, those who are you know, adhering to their responsibilities, uh, abstaining from the prohibitions uh, in this life and the next life, لَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ There's no, need, no reason for them to fear or to be uh, sad. Why is that? The idea here is that huzun, right? What does sorrow do to a person? Sorrow, when it when a person is full of grief or sorrow, what it does is it really sucks them dry of any energy. It, if it gets bad enough, it can lead to depression. And someone who is depressed has no motivation, has no dreams, has no aspiration. They get entangled in a daily routine that's, that's not only unhealthy for them physically and mentally, it's also unhealthy for them spiritually. You know, someone who's depressed doesn't want to get out of bed, how are they going to get out of bed and, and pray to rakas for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? They're not going to have the motivation to make dua. And if they make dua, they're already full of sorrow. They, they, they're pessimistic to begin with. Right? Their dhan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, their thoughts of Allah become negative. Right? So these are problematic. Sorrow does this to us. It results in negativity. And therefore, there's nothing to gain out of it. The heart has nothing to gain when it's sorrow, sorry. Likewise, there's nothing that brings us close. It does not bring us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? Um, rather, sorrow is one of the most beloved tools of the shaitan. He loves it. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, why? Because it cuts the person out off of their, uh, their, their seeking. A person no longer seeks, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when they're sorry, when they have that sorrow. And the shaitan loves it because it cuts the person off from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and he's kind of bringing this point to our minds and warning us, uh, من نجوى من الشيطان ليحزن الذين آمنوا. The najwa, najwa is private talk, and in the Quran, it's it's really used to refer to rumor, spreading rumors, um, speaking ill of other people, uh, speaking in a private manner that's that doesn't bring about any good for society or for the individual. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala saying that this type of private gatherings is from the shaitan. It, he loves it. He's present in these gatherings. And he loves when these gatherings are utilized to uh, create or manifest uh, sin or in it uh, disobedience to the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, occurs. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying this is from the shaitan. And the reason why he loves it, لِيَحْزُنَ الَّذِينَ amanu, To spread sorrow among the believers. You know, when a rumor starts, look at how damaging it is. Especially when the rumor is about someone who is well known, or someone who's respected in the community, um, or it's in a sensitive, it's about something, uh, a sensitive issue. The rumor spread, it creates division, it creates sorrow, grief, regret, all of it. The shaitan loves it. How much money now, especially if it gets into legal issues, how much money is going to be wasted? Right? The bad feelings it creates that lasts decades. The, subhanAllah, there's a, one poet, said that um, uh, resentment uh, continues from generation to generation to where it, it even affects the grandchildren of the people who, you know, who uh, witnessed the problem in the first place, especially in tribalistic societies. Your great-grandfather did this to my great-grandfather and we're still at war with each other 70 years later. I mean, look at how damaging that is. And then as they bicker over their, you know, their petty feuds, the enemy comes and uh, takes over. There's an interesting video of two deer fighting each other. Right? Um, they were fighting each other and they were in headlocks. And in the background, you see something running, coming. And it's a lion. Coming, coming, coming. And these two deers are not paying attention. And the lion gets one of them. And of course, you get that, that wisdom of the day type thing. Right? It says, when we Muslims are fighting each other, the lion comes and eats one of us. 
That's just the reality. That is Muslim history. The only time Muslims have been attacked or put on the defense is when the Muslims were bickering among each other. That was a situation for the Crusaders, for the Mongols, and our current times today. It's, it's quite phenomenal. You know, the, the, the army of the Crusaders was so weak. It, it, was, it was literally a mob of unorganized and uneducated and untrained people. And the question is, how on earth did they get to Jerusalem? Because no one stopped them. No one was there to stop them. Like Syria today. Syrian army is one of the weakest armies in the world. And look what they're doing. Why? Because no one could do it. Right? Whether that's for political reasons, obviously, international affairs, you know, America doesn't want it, our government doesn't want things to change, nor does Russia, and these interference. But in, in all reality, the, the situation in Syria could have been stopped in, in 10 days. Because they're weak. But no one is there. So they go on their onslaughts, and millions of people have been killed, and millions of people had uh, fled their countries. And look at the disaster it's caused. So Najwa, the, the shaitan, wants to spread sorrow and grief, and it creates um, uh, that division and those problems. Allah subhanahu or the pro, in the hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam naha al Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam al an ithnani minhum dun al thalithi li anna dalik The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam forbade two people from speaking to, with one another privately while there's a third person present. Right? This is a common hadith. And to put it in, you know, in another way, when two people speak a certain language, a third person doesn't speak the same language. This happens very often. And it's a lot of times unintentional, right? But it does happen. And why the Prophet ﷺ forbid us from doing that? Because it makes the third one feel sad. Yeah. <clears throat> And, and the Prophet ﷺ sought refuge from sorrow. He says, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al hammi wal hazan. You know, Allah, I seek refuge in you from uh, stress, from worry, and from sorrow. Why? Again, because it, uh, it, it really drains a person. And the people of paradise will say, وَقَالُوا الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ الَّذِي أَذْهَبَ عَنَّا الْحَزَن. You know, Alhamdulillah, I'll praise to Allah, the one who took away our sorrow and our grief. One of the greatest rewards of paradise that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran is that there's no, there's no sorrow. We don't like it. It's not a good feeling. Um, and there are certain narrations that are weak, such as, Wala ala ladina, I'm sorry, no, that one. No, so Ibn Qayyim then says, okay, there is one uh, instance in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises the people and he describes them as being sad and crying. <laughs> Uh, in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is praising those companions who wanted to participate with the Prophet in an expedition, but they couldn't because they didn't have the, the financial capabilities. So the fiqh ruling is that if someone were to leave for an expedition or for some some work for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there need he needs or she needs to he needs to leave enough money behind to support himself and the family, right, in that in that time. He can't just leave his family without any money and he says, okay, deal with yourselves. No, he needs to have that money, right? So some people they wanted to participate but they they didn't have the the financial capability. So they went to the Prophet and said, Ya Rasulullah, you know, help us out. Is there anything? And they're crying and they're sad that they can't uh, support themselves. So some people will look at this and say, you see, this type of sorrow is good for us. But Ibn Qayyim says, no, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not praising them because they were crying and they were, they were sad. Right? He's praising them because, um, uh, because of their, the strength of their iman. That they were so, uh, they wanted so badly to participate with the Prophet والسلام, to the extent that he came out and crying. Now, if the, the same person Right? You have two people who had equal amount of passion right? and, and uh, equal amount of passion when it comes to applying a part of the faith. Uh, um, neither could do it. One of them started crying, the other didn't. Are they really different? Is a person who's crying right, better than the one who's not crying, although their hearts feel the same amount of passion? No, not necessarily. 
right? So the way our emotions manifest ourselves differ from person to person. Some people are able to really hold back their tears. It doesn't mean they're any less sad. They just, not someone who cries. Someone might cry over the smallest thing, right? It's just how they are. They see a dinosaur, for example, uh, they see a dinosaur, like land before time, for example. I remember one guy started crying when he saw Littlefoot. Um, I don't know if you remember, maybe your, your children used to watch this, right? The very first movie when uh, his mother died, I think his mother, um, you know, he started crying when he saw that. I mean, it's just a cartoon, it's not real. It's dinosaurs and stuff. He started crying. That's just how he is, right? Um, so emotions don't necessarily, uh, a person's feelings don't necessarily convert in a sim similarly from person to person. A person can feel strong passion, strong feelings towards something, but it doesn't really appear. Someone might have little passion, but it appears. So don't be fooled by the people who start crying when they recite the Qur'an, okay? They could be uh, very impacted by the Qur'an, or they just could be someone who knows how to cry, right? Just, so we have this tendency, MashaAllah, he's crying when he says three words, <laughs> right? Fine, you know, maybe he, just, he has a soft heart. Doesn't mean he has strong iman. And someone who never cries doesn't mean they have weak iman. We don't know of an incident where the Prophet ﷺ cried publicly in an in a, uh, obligatory prayer. He would cry in his night prayer by himself, right? but not in public. Nor Abu Bakr, in Abu Bakr, when he would be by himself, he would cry while reciting, while reciting the Qur'an, but not otherwise. Um, Okay, um, also another way to, another thing that Muqam uses to support his uh, position is the hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ says, مَا يُصِيبُ الْمُؤْمِنُ مِنْ هَمٍ وَلَا نَصَبٍ وَلَا حُزْنٍ إِلَّا كَفَّرَ اللَّهُ بِهِ مِنْ خَطَايَاهُ That a believer is not inflicted by, uh, afflicted by worry or fatigue or sorrow except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expiates sin from him or her uh, sins because of that. So Ibn Qayyim says that here the Prophet ﷺ is describing sorrow as a musibah, as a type of affliction, calamity. It's not something that we pursue, nor is something that is positive in of itself. Um, also, as I mentioned, uh, the Prophet ﷺ, we don't know him as being someone who was you know, weeping in sorrow. Right? On the contrary, the Prophet ﷺ was known to be very, very uh, uh, uplifting, very optimistic, smiling. He was always smiling, um, and his face was always happy. So the Prophet ﷺ, even though he went through a lot, I mean, just, just imagine this. He lost six of his children. Six of his <laughs> seven children he buried himself with his own two hands, and two of his wives. Right? I mean, how, what, how can someone be more devastated than that? Yet, he was always smiling. He wasn't taken away by his sorrow. Why? Because there's nothing to gain there in terms of spirituality. Um, and there is one narration that says, uh, الله يحب كل قلب حزين, That Allah subhanahu wa loves, loves every, every heart that is full of sorrow. Then this, this narration is, is, not, is not authentic. It, in fact, there is no chain of narrators that we know of. So there is nothing to support the claim that al uh, huzun Sorrow is a station that we utilize or a feeling that we utilize to, get, to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not something that we pursue, that we actively try and engage or cause to come about in order to come closer to Allah, contrary to the other stations. We will actively pursue listening. We will actively utilize our, our listening, our sense of listening in order to come closer to Allah. We will actively use our, for example, tawbah. Right? We will actively use uh, self-evaluation in order to come close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Does, does it make sense, the difference here? Okay. Um, so as we look through Abu Ismail Harawi's explanation and his utilization of huzan, just keep that in mind. Some of what he says is, you know, we will accept it by Ibn Qayyim in that it falls in line with what Ibn, Ibn Qayyim's position. Other of it, you know, it's not that beneficial. So Abu Ismail al-Harwi rahimahullah ta'ala says, Al-Huzun tawajjuun nifaitin wa ta'asufun ala mumtani'in. Huzun 
is feeling pain for something that has passed by, has passed you, um, and you are able to achieve or, or obtain it. And it's also regretting something that you weren't able to obtain. Okay, so there's two things that we, we could be, a person is sorry over. Something that you were able to achieve, but you didn't, or something that you were incapable of achieving, and then that creates a type of regret. And he used the word uh, tawajjah. You feel the pain. Sorrow isn't something that we, you know, enjoy. Right? Sorrow is something that brings us pain. Um, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لِكَيْ لَا تَأْسَوْ عَلَى مَا فَاتَكُمْ وَلَا تَفْرَحُوا بِمَا أَتَاكُمْ In this verse in Surah Al-Hadid, uh, before that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَا أَصَابَ مِن مُصِيبَةٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلَا فِي أَنفُسِكُمْ إِلَّا فِي كِتَابٍ مِنْ قَبْلِ أَنْ نَبْرَأَهَا إِنَّ ذَلِكَ عَلَى اللَّهِ يَسِيرٌ لِكَيْ لَا تَأْسَوْا عَلَى مَا فَاتَكُمْ وَلَا تَفْرَحُوا بِمَا أَتَاكُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that nothing occurs in the world except that it is written in a book before it happens. Right? This is part of our aqeed, this is part of our iman, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows all that's going on and therefore He wrote everything that's going to happen. Um, and then in this verse, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains one of the benefits of believing in this. And that is so that you don't um, regret that which passed you by and you don't become overly excited to where it becomes arrogance over what you have obtained. It's in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You tried achieving something, you weren't able to, don't regret it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it part of His plan. If you tried to achieve something and you weren't able to achieve it, don't worry, don't, don't regret it, it's part of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's plan. If you do attain something, you got the promotion, you got the job, you got the degree, right? you got the million dollars, don't become arrogant. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one who brought it to you. There's nothing to be happy over. So use what you have for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and don't allow it to, to it cause you to become deceived over who you are right? or your capabilities. It's all in Allah's hands. Now, let's be real. We can never fully suppress our emotions. Right? It's actually contrary to the wisdom. However, we can strengthen our heart to where these emotions don't shake it, don't break it. Regret is not something easy to deal with. So if we have the belief that, you know, I didn't get anything, I didn't make it, I didn't accomplish it, and that is, خلاص, you know, قدر الله ما شاء وفعل. We did what we are supposed to do. We put in our effort. We did all that we could. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose for it not to happen or for something else to happen. خلاص, I am content with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has done. It really subdues that regret. You might feel a little bit of pain, man, if only, right? But even then, the Prophet ﷺ says, don't say if, if only this, if only that. The shaitan utilizes that against us, right? But what it does, what this aqidah does, is it helps really maintain and discipline the heart to where that regret is not going to break the heart. And the same thing if we obtain something. Don't let your, your joy deceive you of who you really are. You're still a a weak servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who needs Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, I think this, this verse is very important for us to internalize, to live by. Because if we are able to tame our emotions, we can live a very content-filled life. Uh, that verse is Surah Al-Hadid. I don't know the number. Let me pull it out for you. It's verse. It's chapter fifty-seven, uh, verses twenty-two and twenty-three. Fifty-seven. Chapter fifty-seven, verses twenty-two and twenty-three. Really think about it, contemplate it, and when you contemplate it, apply it to your own life. Look back. Right? Look back at certain things that you wish happened but didn't happen. Or certain things that did happen, but in reality, you know, is that is that your own muscle that accomplished it, or was it Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who who made it happen for you? And then Abu Ismail Harwi rahimullah ta'ala says, Walahu tharathu darajatin. Huzun on his, his standard uh, outline of everything has three levels. Huznu al ammati wa huwa huznun ala tafriti fil khidma. 
وعلى التورط في الجفاء وعلى ضياع الأيام. Um, sorrow, the sorrow of the general or the average Muslim, the average seeker, is having sorrow over a tafrit. Tafrit, farrata, this word means um, to bring something forward, right? And it's used to refer either a tafrit is when you don't do enough to bring it forward. So if you can imagine something, you know, here, physical, I'm bringing this forward, but I didn't bring it forward enough to where anti can, can take it and benefit from it. This is tafrit. Ifrat is the opposite. It's when it's excessive. It's too much. Right? So someone who does tafrit in the religion, they are not doing enough to be in line with what's acceptable. Ifrat is when someone is excessive in the way they apply the religion. I don't mean they do a lot of salah. What I mean is that they're applying more than what's asked for them in a way that's contrary to the sharia. Right? For example, someone who starts inventing acts of worship because they love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so much. That is ifrat. That is a type of fanaticism and extremism that the sharia uh, rejects. So here, <coughs> it's a, a tafrit, it's lacking or slacking in khidmah. And what's meant by khidmah, it is a person's manners and etiquettes when it comes to how they deal with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how they engage Allah. Right? Adab al ubudiyya Haq al ubudiyya How do we develop ethics and character when it comes and manners when it comes to our engagement of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? See, these are things that we not, won't even occur in our minds. Because we think manners and ethics is something just for human to human interaction, even human to animals. But it's just not with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's a type of ethics and manners that we need to adhere to when we do salah, when we do uh, sadaqah. Right? The Prophet says that we only gain from our prayer what we are paying attention in. The amount you pay attention in salah, that's the amount of reward you're getting. And in other hadith, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that to a person who's praying but their mind is focusing somewhere else. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know, give us khushua. Because some things, uh, I'm, you know, maybe I'm wrong, but I feel like some things are a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can't attain it yourself. You need to ask Allah and continue to ask Him until, you know, He sees us as worthy of, of having this thing, like khushua. Right? Someone who is praying, but they have no khushua, they're focusing on something else, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells that person, is there something more important than me to focus on? Right? Now, in the Western mindset, People say, wow, that's arrogance. You know, why does Allah think he's so big? Well, because Allah is really big, right? That's one thing. But let's look at it from a materialistic way. Who's going to bring you more than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What are we thinking about? Our job, how to get the next promotion, our kids, what we're going to cook today? Well, all of those things are coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why not focus on the source instead of on the, the means, subhanahu wa ta'ala? So this is something we should... Uh, be sorry over. But Ibn Qayyim is going to say, no, don't be sorry over it. Rather, uh, contemplate and do i'tisam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Reach out to Allah, do tawbah. This is how we utilize our incompletion, our misapplications of our, our, our lack of adab, our lack of uh, manners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is how we utilize it to get closer to Him. Through tawbah, through i'tisam, right? Through, okay, let me listen to the Quran, istima'ah. Right. These are the stations that we're going to use to come closer, not huzun. Being sad, oh, you know, the last time I prayed, I, it wasn't that good. You're not going to get anything out of it. Nor is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ask us to do it. Rather do tawbah and do dua. وَعَلَى التَّوَرُّطِ فِي الْجَفَاءِ Tawarrut fil jafa is beautiful. Um, al jafa is the opposite of feeling a type of closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now the word jafa is a dryness that's between humans or between two physical things. Right? Jafa is, let me put it a different way. Jafaf, which is another word, jafaf is dryness when it comes to the lack of um, um, when water is, is depleted from a resource, it becomes dry. What's the word? That's for human beings. But let's say earth, the earth, the soil is dry, right? It's dry because there's no water. 
That is jafaf. The skin is dry because it's dehydrated. Right? You say the earth is parched. Parched? It's parched, right? So when jafaf is when something is dry because it doesn't have the nutrition or the, 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 the source that makes it uh, not dry. Jaffa is when there's a dryness between um, feelings, right? The cold shoulder. I'm not talking to so and so. That is Jaffa. So it has to do with the emotional dryness towards something. Um, so Abu Sabahi al Harawi is saying that be, be sad over one's dryness, dryness and emotions, and when it comes to the relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, when someone thinks about Allah, when they read the Qur'an, and they pray, and their hearts are not moved, this is what it's talking about. Why? The whole point of salah, and reading the Qur'an, and listening to the Qur'an, and thinking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is that it moves the heart. Right? It moves the heart in a manner that keeps it alive. Without those emotions, the heart dries up. And if the heart dries up, it, you know, it, comes, it dies. And we say a person, that person is so cold. What do we mean by that? He has no feelings. The person's heart is dead. You have no emotions. Right? Um, so when we engage Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we need to have those emotions. When we listen to the Qur'an, you know, we need to be shaken by the Qur'an. Whether that's shaken by, by fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or hope in Allah, raja, or optimism, or, or just sheer awe. And reverence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he talks about the universe and his capabilities. This is what our hearts need to feel. Uh, but if someone doesn't have that, then that's something to regret and have, uh, be sorry over. Now, how can we really, how can we develop this uns, this nearness to Allah, this, this uh, uh, heart-filled engagement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Well, one of the best ways of doing that, in fact, yeah, one of the best ways of doing that is tahajjud. Waking up at night and praying for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let's say we can't. Our schedules don't really help us in that regard or it's just difficult for the person to get up because of the responsibilities, whatever it might be. Another way of developing that uns, it's really effective. Very simple, but very effective. Is when you're trying to go to sleep, right? make dua. Just keep making dua, oh Allah this, oh Allah that, oh Allah this. Dua has this ability to really move our hearts because it's bringing in multiple emotions. And the more you, you are engaged in your dua, the more the emotions start manifesting itself. And by the way, it could be for anything. It could be, oh Allah, help me with this, uh, uh, this job, help me with this responsibility, help me be a better parent, help me be a better spouse, help me be a better uh, child, whatever it is. Allah, you know, you know, help my ch- kill children with their education, with their marriages, with their children, whatever it is. But when we're doing that, I mean, just the, the moment of engaging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah who is the supreme, the greatest, the perfect subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we have this direct connection to Allah. I mean, it's just a type of uns, a type of serenity that is really unparalleled. Unpar- it's almost surreal. And if you add to that, seeing your dua manifest itself, being answered, I mean, that's just a whole different uh, excitement that it brings to it. So um, that's another thing to, to be sorry over. And the third thing is, ayami wa huwa naw'an, is wasting uh, ayam. Now this word ayam, I'm not gonna translate it. It could be translated as days, but that doesn't really make sense, wasting days. Um, uh, well, I guess that does make sense. So wasting your time, that is something to be sorry over. And there are two types of wasting time. And that is wasting time when it comes to worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, obedience to Allah. Every second that goes by, we lose. That is one of the things that will not, that is one of the things that goes and never comes back. Money comes and goes. You know, even a spouse <laughs> comes and goes. Right? Not a good spouse, he could be replaced. That's just the reality. It's a hard, we don't want that to happen. But that's just the reality. Comes and goes. But time goes and never comes. And there's a saying in Arabic, Al-waktu 
كالسيف إن لم تقطعه قطعك uh, Time is like a sword If you don't cut it, it will cut you So take advantage of your time um, And since our, we are accountable for our time Since our time has such a, a profound impact on our future I mean on, on our afterlife you know, What we lose is something that you know, we lost a lot We lost a lot one second, and to further elaborate on this point, you know, what can you do in terms of worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in one second? You could say maybe three tasbihahs. SubhanAllah, alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah, or maybe two, right? Maybe three. You could do two tasbihahs. Well, how much reward is two tasbihahs? Right? In comparison to other things, it might be you know, smaller, ten hasanat for each one, and then uh, you know, in the hadith, every time you say subhanallah or alhamdulillah or la ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, what's the reward? See if you remember. A tree, right? You get a plant in paradise. Okay. Well, what's that plant mean? Is that something big? Now, when we have our homes, we like to plant some trees. It makes, brings beauty, especially if it's an orange tree or a lemon tree. And Okay. Now, well, what, how, what is a tree? How does the Prophet describe a tree in paradise? A tree is described, right, as so large... It's shadow, if you, a person wants to cross a shadow, not just a person, someone on a, a strong horse rider, a quick horse rider, right? it will take them 70 years to pass the shade. Okay, let's add a little bit more. Every time you eat from the fruit, right? how does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describe it in Surah Al-Baqarah? You take it and you eat it. It automatically replenishes itself. You take the second one, it tastes different. Right? That is a tree, and that requires a second. That is ten hasanat. Okay, let's add a little bit more. The Prophet ﷺ says that the miswak, a span in paradise the size of a miswak, you know, a little bit bigger than my finger. That space in paradise is better than the world and everything in it. Why? You know, I mean, what can you put in that, in that span? This isn't super magic. But I think there's a different point the Prophet ﷺ is, is making that we might, than what we might uh, think of. That span, paradise, is eternal. It never goes away. This life is not eternal. It will, we will leave it, and it will eventually cease to exist. So something that is temporary loses a lot of value. You know, if you think of a company that's going to, it's a temporary thing, it's going to be there for five years, how valuable are the stocks going to be? Now maybe for some, you know, uh, stock market gurus or tycoons or you know these guys they'll take advantage of it but for the average investor you know I'm, I'm looking for long-term investments that's how the stock market works five years that's not really going to bring me much it's not valuable same thing with degrees and I give you this example before if you know a degree is going to be obsolete after 10 years what value does that degree have nothing right likewise the world how much value does the world have if one day it ceases to exist well it's not that valuable the paradise, that's eternity. Not only that, it's constantly becoming better and better and better and better and better to where your place in paradise, uh, year one versus year one million, it's, it's so interesting, right? It's quite different. Right? So regretting or being sorry over the time that we lost. Right? The second way, the second type of sorrow for losing our time or losing our days is Right. is being sorry over the time that has passed by you where you weren't tasting the beauty of Iman. You know, in our times today, in our generations, it's very, very rare for a child to be raised religiously practicing and then remain that way. Almost everyone has a period of time where they weren't praying. Now, it might be a few years after puberty or it might be decades after puberty. But almost everyone has that period where they weren't really engaged. Right? That is time lost when it comes to tasting Iman and the beauty of Iman. And let's look at it in a smaller uh, example. You know, sometimes we feel certain emotions. Sometimes we feel like, man, my Iman isn't that high. We wake up in the morning, you know, as they say, we woke up on the wrong side of the bed. And we lose that taste of Iman. Right? But we've all tasted Iman before. Don't, don't tell yourself I've never tasted it. You've tasted it before. Just think about it. You'll remember. It could be during a Qiyam Layl. 
It could be during Rabbah. The feeling is very motivational. It's very inspiring. It's very comforting. So we should be sorry over every moment that passes by where we're not feeling that. Why? Because we could be feeling that every moment. Right? <clears throat> so that's something to be sorry over. Where are we? Let me see if we should continue. Okay, let's stop there, inshallah. We'll continue next week. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.